Where do your ideas come from? Where were you the last time you had a eureka moment? A lot of people tell me the shower, which is fine. I'm all for personal hygiene, but my place has always been the outdoors. A couple years ago, I found myself surrounded by the natural beauty of a Costa Rican rainforest. But despite all of that splendor, all I could think about was how I needed to finish my graduate thesis and accomplish enough to succeed in an impossibly crowded job market. One afternoon, I was walking back to my tent from some field work when a massive black bug with bright orange wings flew right in front of my face. I knew immediately that this was a tarantula hawk, a spider-killing wasp that I did not <laughs> want to be messing with. So I paused to let her pass, and I watched as she landed on a mound of chewed-up leaves on the rainforest floor, the refuse pile for a colony of leafcutter ants. I started to wonder, what did this fearsome spider hunter want with a bunch of ant trash? As I got closer, I noticed that she didn't walk like a wasp or stand like a wasp or fold her wings back like one. So I looked through my binoculars and found instead that she was a type of fly, doing an amazing imitation of this otherwise dangerous insect. The gears in my head started turning, and I ran back to camp to ask one of my mentors about what I had seen. And he told me it was a fly in the genus Midas, which mimic tarantula hawks and lay their eggs in those ant garbage dumps. <laughs> now, as if this wasn't weird enough, their larvae, like something out of the trash compactor seen in Star Wars, actually devour the ant garbage men. Well, technically, women, all ant uh, workers are females. So, here was this fly, this harmless insect, that kept safe by looking like a wasp with one of the most painful stings in the world and whose young lurked in the compost bins of the rainforest's army of little gardeners. I was blown away. And as I went to bed that night, I realized I had passed the rest of the day without worrying once about my career. This fly, Midas, had taught me a lesson that even in an environment as crowded, competitive, and hostile as a tropical rainforest, you can still find a place, provided that it's innovative and maybe a little unconventional. These sorts of aha moments, the source of new ideas and solutions, are the spark that ignites societal change, successful business models, and personal growth. A reliable place to find these sorts of mind-opening junctures would give us advantages that cannot be overstated. I'm here tonight to remind all of us that we are surrounded by a 24-hour, all-you-can-eat buffet of inspiration, insight, and creative brain fuel. Nature offers us a sort of wild playbook whose innumerable pages not only feed us new ideas and ways of thinking, but which prime our brains to be more focused, balanced, and creative. Now, technically, I'm talking about biodiversity, the richness of ecosystems, species, and happenings that encompasses life on this planet. For over four billion years, that life has overcome countless challenges with even more diverse strategies and solutions. And we, as humans, for our short time, have looked over nature's shoulder to copy down answers to life's toughest questions, and we have found wondrous, powerful solutions. For millennia, we have plagiarized the chemical inventions of plants and fungi for traditional and modern medicine, for everything from relieving toothaches to combating cancer. Meanwhile, engineers have studied the shape of kingfisher beaks to make better nose cones for high-speed trains or camel feet to improve the landing gear of aircraft in desert environments. Clearly, some people are still thumbing through the pages of this wild playbook. The problem is, Many of us are now losing the ability to read them. Those pages are written in the many languages of natural history. Go back a couple hundred years, basic knowledge about plants and animals was an essential life skill. 
not long after that, it was this booming field of professional and amateur scientific inquiry. But today, we tend to think of it more as the eccentric hobby of stuffy old white guys in England. But maybe we're being a little too hasty to dismiss nature's limitless teachings as irrelevant to our busy modern world. Confronting problems in work, in everyday life, many of us struggle to find inspiration and novelty. Business leaders will exhaust themselves searching for a new market niche while ignoring the ecological niches in the park outside their building or residence, the dozens of species interacting, competing, synergizing, all with hundreds of lessons to teach. Those engineering solutions, these new medicines, these are just the tip of the iceberg here. Our human brains are superb at abstract thinking. We can do so much more than just copy and paste nature's chemical or material solutions, but we can unlock new metaphors and analogies that yield powerful, fresh perspectives on issues that matter. All we need to do is open the book and start reading. Great. Uh, how do you do that? I start by taking the time to focus on the non-human world, to really pay attention, to, to, to notice those with whom we are sharing this planet. This can be as easy as watching a spider crawl across my desk or noticing a robin outside my office window. You can do it in a park or a garden or looking at the little plants growing out of the sidewalk. All you need to do is stop, take a deep breath, and engage your senses. Then the questions start coming. Well, is that Robin singing? Who is it singing for? Does that spider use all of its different legs the same way? Are those plants growing out of one side of the pavement but not the other? How come? These sorts of questions could lead us to the next Velcro, a $600 million idea that we owe to sticky plant seeds or some fresh perspective for resolving a personal conflict. But they also yield what psychologists call soft fascination. This is a mental state that restores focus, concentration, and attention. The executive functions with which we apply our brains to problems in work and everyday life. The same executive functions, I might add, that are depleted by overwork, long hours, multitasking, burnout. Sounding familiar to anybody? <laughs> Immersion in nature has been proven to drastically reduce our stress hormone levels, to boost mindfulness, creativity, and mood, all of these traits that make us better thinkers, leaders, and people. The more you know about nature, the more deeply you can become immersed. Every new plant species or bird song that you can identify or even know a story about adds a new dimension to that immersion. Imagine that how much more powerful those mental and emotional benefits could become if we could just step outside of our egos, even for a couple minutes a day, and pay attention to those other lives on this earth. As we become more aware of the many ways that nature enriches our lives and our minds, we start to realize that the destruction of the natural world is a lot more than just missing out on zoo exhibits. We're not just losing tigers and thousands of other species. We are losing everything that they could ever teach us. Consider this. When you bite into a chocolate bar, chances are you're consuming palm oil sourced from the annihilation of an Indonesian rainforest. Every time that we level a natural ecosystem for these sorts of short-term gains, we are tearing up pages from nature's wild playbook and letting them fall to tatters on the ground. Think about it. Somebody wants to read that. It could turn their life around, save a small business, or cure an autoimmune disease. You don't just throw stuff like that away. Appreciating the value of nature and the inspiration, insight, perspective, knowledge that it gives us is a foundational step towards saving it. So take time to watch a moth circle your bedroom lamp at night or when you pause for a drink on a hike. 
Notice the lichens and mosses growing on nearby rocks and trees. By doing these things, you are helping to restore and deepen and nurture a relationship with nature that much of our society has begun to lose. You'll be opening yourself up to a literal world of inspiration, restoration, new ideas. Just as importantly, you're taking the first steps to protecting that world. By looking closer, by learning, by knowing, we love more. And it's so much easier to save what we love. Thank you.